So most of my colleagues um, in cognitive neuroscience believe that our senses were shaped by natural selection, that we evolved, and that the selection pressures are such that those creatures that saw the world more accurately had a competitive advantage over those who saw less accurately. And so they were more likely to pass on their genes that coded for the accurate perceptions. And so the result is after thousands of generations, we're the offspring of those who saw the world more accurately. And so we can be pretty confident that when I see tables and chairs and the sun and the moon and so forth, that I'm seeing reality as it is. No one believes we see all of reality, of course. We only see the parts that we need to see. Uh, but that the parts that we do see, we're seeing truthfully. And so I've looked at that from the point of view of the mathematics of evolution, the evolutionary game theory. And we can actually run simulations to see what happens and we can prove theorems. And we've, we've done both. And the bottom line is that the probability, if our senses evolved and were shaped by natural selection, the probability that we see reality as it is, is zero. And that, that means not simply that I, you know, I don't quite see the shape of a chair correctly or I don't quite see the colors correctly. It's, it's much deeper than that. The problem is that the very language of space and time and physical objects is the wrong language to describe objective reality. You, you could not frame a true description of the world in that language. It's not possible. So it's not that we get it off a little bit here or there. It's that the, this whole thing is just the wrong framework for describing reality. So that seems so counterintuitive and so out there that I think a metaphor is needed to help understand how it might be working. And the metaphor I like is um, the user interface on, you know, the desktop interface on your computer. If you're um, writing an email, and the icon for that email is blue and rectangular and in the middle of your screen, does that mean that the email itself, the file, in your computer is blue, rectangular, and in the middle of the computer? Well, of course not. Anybody who thought that misunderstands the point of the desktop interface. It's not there to show you the truth in this metaphor. The truth would be the circuits and the voltages and magnetic fields. All that complexity, most of us don't want to know about that. That's really nasty. If you had to toggle voltages to craft an email, your friends wouldn't hear from you. It's just too hard. So what evolution has done for us is it's evolved us sensory systems, touch, smell, sight, sound, hearing, all of this, all these sensory interfaces as a user interface that the purpose is to hide reality completely to hide reality, just like your desktop interface on your computer is there to hide the circuits. You don't want to know about the circuits. And yet it allows you to control the circuits, right? By using icons and dragging them and clicking and so forth. You can control the reality without knowing anything at all about it. And that's what evolution did. Three-dimensional space is your desktop. It's a three-dimensional desktop, not just a two-dimensional desktop. And the icons are three-dimensional, not just flat. They're what we call physical objects. So tables and chairs and spoons and forks, these are icons that evolution has shaped to tell us about fitness payoffs and how to get them. So it's all about fitness. Even space itself is about fitness. The distance between me and an apple 10 meters away versus 10 miles away is telling me that it will cost me fewer calories to get the apple 10 meters away. It'll cost me a lot of calories to get the apple 10 miles away probably I should go for the apple that's 10 meters away. So even space itself is representing fitness payoffs and fitness costs. And so, so evolution, in short, has shaped us with a user interface that hides reality on purpose, or, you know, purposes in quotes. Evolution is just a process. But, but it, the effect of the, per, of the process is really to hide reality so that, um, so that you're, you're, you're not um, distracted by it and you, you, you can control reality without actually knowing what it is. And so this theory of evolution that I mentioned that says we don't see reality as it is has a really strange consequence. It means that when I see a physical object like an apple, effectively I'm creating that apple as a data structure in my interface 
much like if I'm in a virtual reality and I I'm, have a headset on, and every time I turn over here, I will see something. I'm rendering that in real time. I see an apple. As I go over here, um, I'm no longer rendering. I, you know, I, the, the apple's gone. But as soon as I turn over there again, I will again create a three-dimensional apple. So I'm saying this doesn't just happen in virtual reality. It happens in everyday life. I look over here. I see an apple. I'm literally creating that data structure because now I, I'm effectively an apple is a description of fitness payoffs and how to get them. It's all about fitness. That's the key thing. Evolution is all about fitness. But that means that the objects don't exist as pre-existing things. When I see an apple, we like to think, well, I'm, that's because there really is an apple. And I'm saying, no, no, there's some other reality out there. But just like the blue icon on your desktop doesn't re resemble the true file, the apple does not resemble anything in objective reality. It's an abstract data structure that's just telling you how to act to get fitness payoffs. Here's the kicker. When you look inside your brain, inside your skull, and you see a brain, that's also just a data structure that you're creating. Neurons are just data structures. They don't exist. And this is the weird stuff. I don't have a brain when no one looks. And some of my colleagues would say, yeah, I agree with that. <laughs> you don't have a brain. Uh, but but the, the point of this is that, that we create any physical object that we see in the moment that we see it. And so neurons don't exist when they're not perceived. Therefore, neurons could not be the source of our conscious experiences. In fact, space-time itself is just your data structure. So the idea that space-time exists and has existed for 14 billion years as a pre-existing stage in which the drama of life plays out is also deeply wrong. Space-time itself is just a data structure that we create. So what is reality? It's a long answer to your question, but the answer is I don't know, but I'm trying to come up with a reality that would allow me to solve this hard problem of consciousness. So if the brain is just a symbol that we create when we look, and I'm trying to understand how consciousness is related to it, if I start with the theory in which consciousness is fundamental, and I have to do it scientifically, say, what do I mean precisely by consciousness uh, with mathematical precision? And, and I have this theory of, that I call conscious agents, in which conscious agents interact. It's like a the, the proposal is that reality is a vast social network. It's a, like a Twitterverse or Facebook. So it's, it's a big social network of conscious agents. That's the reality. They're not in space and time. They're, they're just consciousnesses interacting with each other. As they interact, they uh, are passing experiences back and forth. And there's, it's, it's an infinite Twitterverse, an infinite set of consciousnesses out there in this, in this um, big social universe. Social, you know, yeah, social network universe, and any single conscious agent in that network would be overwhelmed trying to understand all of it. Like if you were trying to understand Twitter, there's tens of millions, hundreds of millions of users, billions of tweets. How are you going to try to understand what's going on in the Twitterverse? Well, you can't. But what you can do is you can use visualization tools. Suppose I have a visualization tool that compresses it all down, shows you what's trending in this city and what's trending over there. So you compress it all down and maybe into something that you can see through a headset so that you can actually, uh, well, here's the Twitterverse in, in London, here's the Twitterverse in Edinburgh and so forth, and here's what's, what's going on, here's what's trending. Then you could sort of visualize it. That's what evolution did for us. The reality is this big, vast social network of interacting conscious agents. Each individual agent would be overwhelmed because it's infinite social network. And so what we call the physical world just is our visualization tool. That's what we have. So we've mistaken. So this is all a big visualization tool. Space, time, and physical objects are the way we visualize our interaction with this vast um, universe of yeah, social network in universe. I'll give you one concrete example to really bring it home. When you look at your face in the mirror, all you see literally is skin, hair, and eyes. But what you know firsthand that you don't see in the mirror is the whole universe of your conscious experiences, your hopes, your desires, your aspirations, your headache, um, the, the sound of music that you're hearing right now. Um, your love of, of music, all the stuff that's you, that's a, it's an almost infinitely complicated universe of conscious experiences. All we can see is this. And compared to the vast universe of our conscious experience, this is extremely simple. If I smile, you can guess that I'm happy, or I'm feeling some conscious experience, but a smile does not resemble happiness. 
It's just, it signifies it. And so think about it this way, your face, my face, the, the, the face that you're creating when you look at me is your portal into my conscious experiences. The face that I see when I look at you is my portal into your conscious experiences. It's a portal, but it's very, very small portal. Most of you is left out. You can't see it in the mirror. I can't see it from outside. When I look at my cat, the portal is even worse. I mean, I can figure out maybe the cat likes this kind of food and doesn't like that. It likes it when I pet, but now I've petted it too much. Now I need uh, to stop. When I look at an ant, my interface is really giving up. I have no insight into the conscious agents in this vast network that I'm interacting with. And when I get to what I call a rock, my interface has given up, but it has to give up. I have a finite interface. I'm dealing with an infinite social network. Of course, the interface, that's its purpose, is to throw most of the information away to simplify things and allow me to negotiate with this universe of you know, interacting conscious agents. Um, without getting overwhelmed. And so, of course, at some point, it's not going to look conscious anymore at all. My interface is giving up. But what we've done is we've mistaken a necessary limitation of our interface, as a, and we've taken it to be an insight into the fundament, fundamental nature of reality. We've assumed that reality fundamentally is unconscious, because at the simplest level, our interface ne is necessarily unconscious. So physicalism is a very simple mistake. This assumption that space-time and matter are fundamental is a simple mistake. We've mistaken a limit of our interface as an insight into objective reality. But it's a, well, we, can, we can break out of it. It's, it's, it's a natural mistake, but we could break out of it. So. Well, we've tended to think that most people imagine that the world is something out there and it's divided into bits. And the puzzle of life is to work out what those bits are. And indeed, the puzzle for human knowledge has been to try and work out what those bits are. And uh, I think that we've, in the 20th century, discovered that um, we can't actually arrive at an account of, of, of what is out there because we are embedded in a perspective and there are an indefinite number of perspectives. And so I take the rather surprising starting point that let's consider the world not as being something that's divided into bits, but is something other. It's some unspecified other. And that what we do is we close this, and what I call this unspecified other openness, to avoid us thinking that it's something in particular. And we close the openness of the world into our ideas of thoughts and things and properties and so forth. And the, uh, what we do in the, in the closing of the openness of the world is we give ourselves ways of intervening, but at the same time we sort of cut ourselves off from the openness. So it's a sort of two-way exercise that we need closures in order to intervene, but um, they also in a way uh, take us further away from openness. So, if you take a, 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 an example of, uh, of this bottle, um, you might say, well, it, it, it's, a, it's a bottle. And by doing that, uh, it means that we can do things with it. You can ask me what sort of bottle it is, you can ask me to pass the bottle, you can uh, say what's in it, uh, you can say where was it manufactured, you can ask all sorts of things about what it is. But, um, you might say, you might describe it not as a bottle at all. You, you might uh, describe it as a, as a weapon. Um, in which case, it's, well, is it an effective weapon? Uh, does, it, does, it, uh, does it do the damage that you intended it to do? Uh, you might say it's um, an environmental disaster. In which case you would say, well, just how dangerous is it as an environmental disaster? You know, uh, it, where does it fall on the scale? Uh, if you were a physicist, you might describe it in terms of its molecular structure. So all of these different ways of holding this bit of the world are closures, I would say. They're ways of closing openness. And the stuff, the openness, this whatever's there, is all of these things. It's like the potential to hold them in those ways. So I think we have to give up the idea that there's, there are bits out there that we name and instead thinking of the world as being open that we close. And those closures have value and they can be refined and they can get better, but they're not somehow an ultimate description. They're a way of holding the world 
rather than uh, it being how it ultimately is. So if we can't avoid uh, closing off the world, but it means that that openness escapes us, what is the point in the pursuit of um, trying to understand the world? Because we can refine our closures. Uh, once we've chosen one, we can ask all sorts of questions about it. So as I was saying, you know, if, if we, if we um, hold something in a particular way, we can say, well, what sort of example of this is? What sort of bottle is this is? What sort of you know, uh, person this is? What, what, whatever the closure is. So we, we refine those closures, and those closures then enable us to do more. So uh, the attempt to deepen our closures uh, and make them a achieve the outcome that is where we, what we want from them to, to enable us to use that frame, that vocabulary in a way that's valuable, is, uh, is, a, is immensely, immensely powerful. It's just that I think that we shouldn't uh, think that they are an ultimate description of the world. They're a way of holding it, and there's an indefinite number of other ways of holding it, uh, which have different qualities and different values. And I think also the other thing is that closure is never the same as openness. It's a different sort of stuff. I think it's a category mistake to think they're the same sort of thing. They're, they're just different sorts of things. So if you look closely at whatever the closure is, it will never be as the world is. So you can always find ways in which your closure fails. They're always going to fail. There's never going to be a closure where we think, oh, yeah, we've, got, we've sorted it now. It, it, there's always an infinite gap between closure and openness. But trying to refine them and make them more effective for whatever purpose we want for is an immensely valuable exercise, just as is finding the ways in which they don't work. <laughs> so I think the idea that we close off the world in these ways is quite a would sound familiar to a lot of people, but could you explain what openness is? Because that is a, that seems like a huge uh, idea. Yes. So, you have to provide some sense, I'm not, I'm a, no, a non-realist, so I'm a critic of the idea that our ideas reflect things that are out there in the world. So the question is, what's the alternative to realism? And I would describe myself, therefore, as a post-realist or a non-realist. And that's because I can't tell you what is going on other, as it were, than realism. I can't say, well, it's like this, because if I could, then I would be, my, uh, you know, I would be a realist again. I would be telling you that's what it is out there. But it seems to me that our experiences are not descriptions of the world, they're not like mirrors of the world, they are a causal response to the world. So when your eye responds to the world, a neuron fires, you know, one of the hundred million neurons, whatever, fires, well that neuron is responding in one particular way to everything that's out there. So it takes all of the openness of the world and it does one thing, and we hold the world as that one thing. <laughs> so, it, well, it, I mean, in fact, of course, we hold all a whole load of neurons together as, say, a patch of blue. And all of those neurons won't be firing in exactly the way, same way, and they won't be blue. But what we do is we hold things as a, as a single thing. But the world's nothing to do with that thing. It's not a description. It's a closure. Um, so. When I, uh, when I set, describe the world as being, uh, as, uh, use the word openness, I am, would be saying that it's an unspecified other. And I'm not saying that there's no, there's nothing out in, it's all in our heads. There's plenty of stuff out there, but it's not differentiated. It's not, you know, it's language that differentiates things into objects and things and properties and, you know, all of that sort of stuff. But what's out there is a different sort of thing. And the way of trying to give an idea of what it's like is to say, well, let's just 
imagine that it's an unspecified other and a way of thinking about it is to think it as being open and full of potential. And we, we close that potential with our closures, but we can't, if I could tell you what openness was, then I, I wouldn't be a non-realist, I would be a realist again. And I think we just have to give up the idea that we can say, as it were, how it ultimately is, in favor of this, this account which enables I think a way of understanding why it is we have different perspectives, why people can have such radically different views and all think they're right. Um, and, and indeed to point to perhaps you know, other ways that we could interact so that we uh, can try and stand in the place of other perspectives rather than thinking that there's a correct answer um, and somebody's got it wrong and somebody's got it right. Our brains operate with very small amounts of information. We don't have access to all of our physical environment through our brains. We just sample small parts of it and we make up a whole lot of the rest. So based on this very sparse information, we create this grand simulation of reality. But a lot of that is made up in a sense, even if it has a physical correlate out there, nevertheless, our brain is constructing it. A couple of examples. The insights of objects. If I think about a solid object, say the back of my phone is a rectangle, I can see the edges and I can see the inside. But neurons in the early stages of my visual system, they're only responding to the edges. It is only later on along the visual pathway that neurons take this information from the edges and use it to make up what the inside must look like. We call this filling in. And it applies to a whole lot of our vision. It applies to our cognitive processes too. We fill in a lot of cognitive gaps. Another example from a perceptual standpoint is our perception of 3D. So to be sure, we believe that there is a third dimension out in the world, but our perception of 3D from a visual perspective is a brain construct. Our perception of 3D is fundamentally a brain construct. Our retinas are basically two flat surfaces that give us only 2D information. And it is based on this 2D information that later on, our visual brain is able to make up this third dimension, which again, even if it matches reality, is a brain construct. Our brains are constantly trying to make sense of the world. We're trying to connect causes and effects, make inferences which may be real, may be illusory. And so we come up with stories. We tell each other stories about how things work. We tell ourselves stories about our own behavior. In fact, research suggests that we interpret our own actions much as we do the actions of other people. We don't think necessarily and then we act, but we act and then we try to come up with a good explanation for why we behave the way we did. I don't think that we need to be frightened of illusions. I think we should uh, generally embrace illusions. Illusions have evolved with us. They're part and parcel of who we are. They're fundamental to our neural processes. It is interesting that the visual system, which is of our sensory systems, the one that takes up more brain space, we have over two dozen brain areas dedicated partly or wholly to the processing of visual information. So our vision is very refined compared to most of our other senses and yet we have a lot more illusions in vision than in the other senses, which to me it's um, one good argument for how illusions are not something to get rid of but something that are part of our neural function. They're, they're not a bug, they're a feature. And the same can be said of other kinds of cognitive illusions. For instance, in estimation of probabilities, it turns out that people who are healthy have healthy brains and good um, 
uh, mental health, in estimation of probabilities, people who are in good mental health, turns out that they're a lot more optimistic than clinically depressed people who are actually realists. They have a much more accurate estimation of what their probabilities of success are, for instance, in a game of chance. The, the phenomenon of illusion is quite interesting because it tells you something about how our perceptual work, how, how our perceptual systems work, and what happens if they don't work. And what happens if they don't work is that you get a variety of different uh, um, experiences that we would consider to be illusory, like hallucination, and when you see mirages and dreams and so on. And they seem to project or, or convey a different kind of reality or a different kind of. Uh, um, uh, type of reality that you experience and now the question is of course is that as real as the um, reality of the waking world is it a different kind of reality or is it just something that looks like reality but isn't really right so this kind of phenomenon which you can uh, which you can investigate quite precisely by using empirical means raises these very deep uh, philosophical questions about uh, the nature of the world and the nature of our perceptual relations with the world. So to that extent, illusions are a very interesting way and very, very, I think, very good example of getting into a discussion of these fairly fundamental questions. And so do you have an example of one such illusion which gets to these fundamental questions? Well, I mean, you, you'll start up with a very everyday ex experience like dreaming, right? So everybody dreams, most people dream every night, and you are, when you're dreaming, you're transported into a, a world which is very, very different from, the, from your waking world. You s probably still think you are you, so there's some kind of continuity, but it's already very difficult to say, you know, what kind of time you are in you know are you you obviously not usually you don't dream that you are that it's night when you are night right so obviously in a different kind of time you might be in a, in, a, in a space that's completely different from your usual surroundings so you have this experience of being immersed into a completely different world which once you are in the dream looks exactly as real as all of this stuff here yeah and now the question is if you are so completely taken in by that in this situation why are you more convinced that when you are in the waking world, as I think I'm right now, why are you more convinced that you are actually really in touch with things that are out there, like a really exist in space-time, whereas in a dream where it exactly feels the same, but we would think, no, in that case, this is all just something cooked up by your mind or cooked up by your brain. Yeah? So to that extent, just a very, very everyday phenomenon like dreaming gets you into, into those kinds of uh, questions. And this is why philosophical traditions from all around the world have focused on that and thought that was a really interesting theoretical problem. And so you see these as philosophical problems rather than scientific problems which might be able to explain these issues of illusion? Yeah, I think these two, these two issues work together, right? Of course, there is, there is the, the scientific question, you know, what actually happens when we're dreaming, what kind of neurological processes are involved, how do they differ from the kind of neurological processes that are involved in the, in, the, in the waking world and so on. So this is what stuff science can tell us a lot about. Yeah? But what the, the next question that we want to ask then, and that is where the, where the scientific question stops, is what is actually at the other end of the representation? What is being represented, right? And that is something which um, uh, is a question that asks something about what is at the other side of empirical means, and that is not something you can investigate by empirical means because the empirical means only take you so far. Yeah. So to that extent, the the, the scientific questions um, have to end at, at, a, at a certain point, and at that point, you really have to start with theoretical reflections about the scientific results in order to get any further. And so you said that philosophical traditions all, all over the world have sort of dealt with these illusions mm -hmm. or like the phenomena of dreaming for instance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why has your work focused on philosophically and how, has, how have they dealt with this? Why so not you've, worked, yeah. you've worked a lot on Buddhist philosophy. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is this something that you can draw on to help explain these illusions? Well, the, the pheno I mean the phenomenon of dreaming became very important in specific parts or branches of Buddhist philosophy, where in general the whole idea that the, the world is in some way illusionary was, uh, became a, a major intellectual focus. And um, different, different 
Indian thinkers in particular tried different ways of trying to explain that and trying to make sense of what that means. And one way of trying to explain it was, was saying, look, the entire world is mental in substance, right? So when we um, look at things, so I see this tent over there and uh, uh, there's actually not an, there's not an external object out there, but it's rather what I see is some some construction or concatenation of mental things, of ideas, or of different moments of consciousness, or something like that, right? And so what, what they've been trying to do there was trying to develop a, um, a, a theory of the external world that didn't assume that the fundamental entities or the fundamental constituents of reality are bits of matter, but bits of mind, right? So to that extent, it's, it's quite an interesting way of trying to come up with a theory that is the complete inverse of we normally, what we normally uh, think is the best way of explaining the world, namely, first of all, explaining the material bit and then seeing how mind gives rise to that. What they were trying to do was the, the other way around. They started with the idea of, of consciousness and mind as a primitive, and then they tried to come up with an idea of how the material world could arise from that. And where are your own thoughts on this? Do you think mind comes before matter or matter comes before mind? Ah, well, that's a very good question. I think, um, uh, well, if you, if you answer the question either way, you'll have to assume that there is some level of reality that is fundamental and everything comes from that, right? So you have a kind of foundationalist picture. Now, I think that is probably, um, is probably not a satisfactory way of thinking it in the end because what you end up with is um, a set of entities such that the um, dependence relation go, go, go both ways, right? So material stuff determines mental stuff and de mental stuff determines material stuff. So it goes, it goes both ways around, in which case you'll end up with a position where you have no fundamental theory yeah? or you have no rock bottom uh, ontology um, to explain it all. So you end, end up with this kind of coherentist picture where everything uh, depends on some other things, but there are no completely independent things. Yeah? So I think that is the most, the, the most satisfactory philosophical way of thinking about it. The last book before Z was A Field Guide to Reality, which is a, a book about um, this idea really of a, a field guide to reality, a sort of perfect manual for fixing existential angst. What would happen if we had a perfect book that would solve all our existential dilemmas? You know, why am I here? What's the meaning of life? Um, and you'd have this single absolute book. And like so many fictional concepts, it can't really exist. It's absurd. But I thought I'd have a narrator who was, among other people, trying to find it because ostensibly it did exist. But even in my parallel reality, it's been lost. And so she's on this quest. So that was a first person narrator because I wanted to be in her mind trying to fathom this quite strange idea of this perfect book that keeps eluding her. But would you define your work as fiction or as sort of philosophical novel? Or? Yeah, I think it's definitely fiction. I'm really interested in the idea of the phys philosophical novel as a thing. And I mean, Camus said that all novelists well, all the novelists he sort of liked were philosophers because they were asking, as soon as you think about a reality, think about creating a reality, you start asking, well, what is a reality? You know, what, what does it comprise of? Um, so as Borges um, demonstrates, you can take a philosophical concept and you can make a fictional scenario out of it. So you can say, for example, what if there was an infinite place where every part of a person's life could be represented every, every possible reality. And so you can do that in fiction because you can do anything in fiction. And so you can advance philosophical ideas um, and sort of almost put them into practice in invented worlds. And so tell us about Z. what's it about? So Z, um, I was thinking for a long time about how to write about the digital age and this huge revolution that we've all lived through the last 20 years where society has completely changed through technology and we've just completely radically alter the way we spend our time and our perceptions of reality because we exist online in this strange semi-incorporeal state which is the cyber world um, and so so much has changed and also we've had the advent of kind of all-seeing technologies that can overlook us to a great extent um, through all these devices that we have, our phones and our computers and even our TVs and so I want to write something about that and I had this idea that there's a huge amount of um, prediction that goes on now. There's an idea that not only do um, all these kind of companies 
take data um, and use it to control advertising and you know advertise more specifically to people. Um, there's also a, a further layer of that where they try to nudge us towards the things that we're um, expected to like. So it's not enough just to predict it, you try and urge the behaviour towards this as well. And I thought that was really interesting and I thought what does that say about humans and free will and you know, are you really able to execute free will if your, your kind of in, environment and reality change around you in line with the notion of what you want? And did the process of writing it leave you feeling hopeful about uh, the ability to have free will in a, a world of technology? Yes, I mean, I thought it's really interesting when you look at algorithms. I mean, algorithms are a kind of to-do list for a computer. You know, if this happens, this, if this and this, then this. And so, um, and I was really interested in Borges' idea of the Garden of Forking Paths, the story he wrote in the 40s, um, where he said, if you're going to really write a realist novel of a person's life, you'd have to include all the possible realities that they might ever live in, all the forks in the path, you know, all the paths they might take. And so the novel would be infinite and also unreadable and unwritable. And I thought that was such an interesting idea in terms of anticipation, prediction of it. even one human life. Actually, there's so much that's unexpected about everything we do as humans. We're not easily predictable in so many interesting ways and people surprise us all the time that we know. And so I thought that kind of interesting idea of trying to almost trying to marshal humans through a perfect system but actually humans being the unexpected elements in that system i thought that was such an interesting philosophical tension to explore in a novel for more debates talks and interviews subscribe today to the institute of art and ideas at iai tv